Good evening, everybody. I hope you are all well and healthy and um, looking forward to what looks to be a very interesting uh, evening's uh, talk. So this evening we are being, we're listening to Terry Ransom, um, who has worked in the aerospace industry for over 30 years, uh, building and testing satellites and spacecraft. Um, interestingly, he um, worked on the, Sky, the Skylark space rocket in um, or on the 10th of May 1971, 50 years ago, when he pressed the red button that launched Skylark SL812 with an X-ray payload from the University of Leicester. Now, um, most of you won't know, but we have in our uh, headquarters um, several parts from a Skylark rocket. Can I ask you, Terry, you know the, um, the point on the Skylark nose cone? Yeah. What was that made of? Good Lord. Um, 50 years ago, <laughs> I, I guess that was pretty hefty, sort of a, a steel based, I would think. I guess yeah. it had to be, you know, that, that's where you're going to get all your heat. Somebody seems to have got one here. Well, yes. Uh, that's correct. It's a titanium uh, tip of a Skylark nose cone. SL123. Uh, Sorry, 1123. Well, the interesting thing was the one that the rocket that we've got never had a, um, a tip. And I had to make a replacement, which I only used aluminium because uh, I haven't got the, the right material. But uh, very interesting, anyway. So, uh, by coincidence, it was where Leicester was where you stood in experimental space physics between 1969 and 70 and then started work with British Aircraft Corporation later the BAE, BAE and as a beginner you was the assistant payload engineer but still interested with the red button before computers did it all of course. It wasn't a great success the moon detector tracked the first stage of the rocket instead of the moon which meant the star tracker never had a hope of locking in to any star, which meant the payload, payload was pointing the wrong way when the parachute deployed, so it landed with a bump. Obviously what happens to the nose cone and the tip? So then um, the final highlight of your career was working at the Russian uh, Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, from where Yuri Gagarin embarked on his first human space flight. It's still busy launching astronauts um, and cosmonauts today to the International Space Station and lots more. He took with him the UK Mars Lander Beagle 2, the probe that was lost on Mars at Christmas in 2003, but found 11 years later. So in the talk tonight, he'll tell of Beagle 2 and Kazakhstan experiences and um, a little more up-to-date information. He took early retirement but became heavily involved in the British Schools Museum in Hitchin, Hertfordshire. He managed the museum as a volunteer for three years and was a trustee for six. There he developed a love of local history, acquired an in-depth knowledge of the early history of the elementary education and became an advocate of lifelong learning. So mm -hmm. If you put your hands together, please, and welcome Terry Ransom. Thank you. Over to you, Terry, when you're ready. Right, where's the magic button? Screen share. Ah, come on. Share. Right, go on then. That's it. Yep. Well, it has that. Um, move that out of the way. I can't get rid of all you folk. Um, there we are. Right, okay, I've, I've titled this to Mars via Kazakhstan. Um, why not? Um, that's a, a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope of, of Mars. And uh, I hope my sort of shirt tonight somewhat matches the right coloration. It, it's, it's not, it's a bit bright, but there we go. 
Anyway, talk just a little about, about me. I think you've heard a fair bit of it. But yes, that was me in October the 4th, 1957, when Sputnik 1 was launched. That was also from Baikonur in Kazakhstan by the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Um, 12th of April, 1961, Grammar School Days, that was Yuri Gagarin. And that was, of course, 60 years ago this year. So thank you for having me in this particular year. Uh, well, what else happened? This 21st of July, it's a, just about the, well, it's the month in which I graduated in electrical engineering. And that's the day that uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin put their, their feet, foot marks on, on Mars. So I, I was kind of a, a child of the space age and we'd certainly followed the space program the manned Mars uh, moon moon missions through the late 1960s, and I certainly wanted to go and work in, in the business. We all dreamt that it was going to be NASA, but in actual fact, we uh, in Britain, we were just getting going. Well, I had that year at Leicester, experimental space physics. Um, I knew nothing about Skylark at that point. We were detecting cosmic rays uh, with sort of scintillator detectors on the roof of the physics building there. Um, so at 1970, I turned up in this building, which was surrounded by just about nothing down here at Filton in Bristol. It was a brand new spacecraft integration and test building, and it was built for communication satellites at the time. That was where my, my boss sat, but I was quickly shifted across to the main works where um, they were building, putting together Skylark payloads. So, yeah, they certainly, um, within a few weeks, they said, how would you like to go to uh, Australia to launch a sounding rocket? I thought, well, blimey, that, I'm in the space program already. And uh, I think you've heard SL812 Woomera, uh, 1971, it was the 10th of May. Um, yes, those, the, the spikes on the nose cone are very valued and the payload engineer always snuffled that one away before anybody else could get to it. Um, I happen to have a bent telemetry aerial um, that would never bend under normal circumstances, but crashing down from 200 kilometers, it bent. So that's my souvenir. I haven't got it here with me now. Uh, yeah, that, that's what it would look like if you could see it in daylight. That's, that's another probe. And well, I, I kind of just, what's that, four years ago now, I actually put this one together for the Aerospace Bristol Museum, which is just the other side of the, the runway from the Filton Works where we used to do this. Um, I only worked on the payload end, but they had uh, the, the main Raven motor and the Cuckoo booster and the Goslin um, third stage, and they didn't know how to put it together. Well, they were lucky to find me, weren't they? <coughs> so, well, I went on to Hang on. I went on to the GEOS spacecraft then. <clears throat> they were geostationary satellites, 23,000 miles uh, altitude. Uh, there were two of them. The first one didn't get quite in the right orbit, so we had to launch a second one. Uh, dear me, that meant two trips out to Florida and Cape Canaveral. <clears throat> uh, they, they were exploring the magnetosphere magnetic electric fields, solar wind particles, and the like. So the second one was very successful and it managed to work in conjunction with the first. Now oh, there we are on the right, and another ancient picture doing something with uh, a GEOS satellite. There I am, very young, uh, on the Delta launch vehicle pad. That's the whole team of the European Space Agency and contractors who were lucky enough to get out to launch. And then I quite liked America, so I applied for a job 
I went to build a few external tanks for the space shuttle. That isn't one of mine. Um, I was a, a contractor there for, a, for about four years, looking after test procedures. But I came back. I worked on the Hubble telescope at Bristol. We built up the, the young lady there, photon detector assembly, which went into the faint object camera, one of the European uh, payload uh, packages that, that went up first at the first launch. And it came out again a few years later to be replaced by something. And we also built two sets of solar arrays. Uh, that's, that's one of them there being deployed on a water table so it floats out and not affected by gravity too much. I went on to Envisat. I, I did some of the preparatory planning for that and then other people took over. That's environmental um, monitoring and climate um, monitoring. But then came another project, Beagle 2. And if you, you may remember, that was to be launched on Mars uh, with the Mars Express spacecraft on the 2nd of June 2003, or thereabouts. You have a certain launch window. So I'm going to talk about the origins of that. What is its, what's its science? Uh, how, how come it uh, got built at all? Uh, how we in industry built and, and sent it on its way to Mars? As uh, you heard, it, yes, it got lost. But what, so where did it go? We did find it. And uh, just a quick look at what's happened since. Um, I have to keep amending this presentation now because every two or three years, there's a few more launches to Mars and I do like to keep things up to date. Yeah, what's happening now indeed. Well, my story starts in 1969 with Colin Pillinger. He was a research scientist. He uh, studied science at uh, Swansea University. But in 1969, he was back here in the University of Bristol. Uh, he was born in Bristol, in fact, in the suburb of Kingswood. And he, somebody gave him a meteorite from, uh, from actually he proved, well, they had proven, came from Mars. It was something knocked off Mars and it had lain in the Antarctic regions uh, for many, many years, of course. And they proved it was from Mars. He analyzed that. Um, it was a black object sitting on uh, white, white ice, so it was fairly easily found and picked up. And that's his mass spectrometer and all the gadgetry that he used to analyze that. Well, when man landed on the moon, Colin asked for some samples from that first mission with Neil Armstrong, and he got some. He, got, he was the first person outside of the US to get a sample. He went to London to collect it. And being a bit of a showman, the first thing he did was put it on display. His, his samples of moon, a bit of rock and a bit of dust outside the university, and Bristol queued up to go and see them. Then scrolling on, moving on by 1997, Colin had moved on. He was professor of planetary sciences at the Open University in Milton Keynes. And he spotted an opportunity. The European Space Agency was hinting that it was thinking about a mission to Mars. It was going to be called Mars Express. It would be launched in 2003 when the trans went because of the alignment of, of Mars and the Earth, the transit time was pretty low, it was about six months. And that was their concept at the time. Well, Colin said, I'd want to look at some rocks. Now I'm not going to get rocks back from Mars. So we told ESA, European Space Agency, if you want to take some samples, and I would like some of your samples, you need to land on the surface. So how about carrying a little lander? on your spacecraft. And he promised to get the funding for a British built uh, lander to go off and uh, fly on that mission, land and do a bit of analysis. His, his logic was, well, 
if I could show that Mars has water and some of the, the material there are carbonates and some is organic matter, that doesn't necessarily mean living matter. I mean, oil and coal are organic, is organic matter because it's made up of carbon and oxygen and that sort of thing. So if I can prove that Mars has got that, then we've got conditions where life could happen. He certainly wanted, his case was, I'm looking for life on Mars, not just analyzing as, as the Americans were doing at the time. And if that organic matter has got an ordered structure, carbon-12 isotope is greater abundance than carbon-14, then there may well be life have developed in the past. And we're looking at the, the, the ancient, ancient, really, really fossilized sort of bits of life. But if we can find methane in the atmosphere, well, let's put it bluntly that all, all sort of living material does, say, break wind at some point um, and, and lets out a bit of methane, then life may well be going on now. That was his argument. And he came up with a, a brief design. He uh, showed this to ESA and he asked them, and they kind of said, well, you're going to have to prove you can build it and that it will survive and that it will do the job. So he came along to us. Um, British Aerospace or British Aircraft Corporation have become British Aerospace. And they weren't totally into space. So they sold us to Matra Marconi Space. That was an Anglo-French company, Matra from France, Marconi from Portsmouth in the UK, and they took over us and our pension schemes and all that. And we said, well, that's, if that tries to land, it's all got square corners and square corners don't like going bump onto surfaces. The thing will fall apart. We'll have to redesign it for you. But you can see there, he has a, an arm that comes out and the thing that he called the mole, this mole, this little tube, was going to shuffle along the surface until it hit a rock, dig underneath the rock, take a bit of dust and put it back into the sensor, the, the, the little oven inside the lander there, uh, heat it up and detect what gases came out. So anyway, we took it away. Um, and redesigned it. I worked on some of the initial programming and cost estimates. And then all of a sudden, Matra Marconi Space says, we're closing you down in Bristol. How would you like to go to Stevenage in Hertfordshire to carry on working? Well, I did. I went up to Stevenage. And I was, after a, about a year, I was put onto the uh, systems engineering program for, as it was called, Beagle 2. Beagle after Beagle 1 was Charles Darwin's ship, which went around the world looking at different life forms. So Beagle 2 seemed it seemed like a good idea. So we took that design and we changed it into something circular. Uh, it evolved from sort of top right to bottom left to bottom right. You can see the number of solar panels has changed. It's certainly got a rounded appearance and uh, structure so that if it hit something, it will roll and come to a stop before it digs a corner into to dust and uh, breaks up. The, the arm, the deployable arm, has got a far, far more complex set of instrumentation on the end by now. And we shall uh, have a look at that later. One thing that you can see in the top right is standing upright uh, an, an antenna that was intended to send data back to Earth, but it was proved that wouldn't work. You can't really see anything on the bottom left, but on the bottom right, there's that big yellow square. That's a, a slot antenna, and that's the chosen way of communicating, not directly back to Earth, but up to the Mars Express spacecraft, and hence transmitted onwards to Earth. Here we are, there were, we were, this was, whoops, 
Did I go back up? Where do I go back up? Um, don't worry too much about the science. I'm not sure I could uh, explain everything, but we're looking at exobiology, which is bio, you know, life outside of Earth. Morphology and geology and the atmospheric surfaces, uh, interface, um, oxidized dust, and what's in the atmosphere, and hopefully over time as well. So all sorts of things can be done. You can see there's a couple of spectrometers there with um, the Mossbauer and X-ray. They have radioactive sources that will actually look, uh, dig, uh, press them in, in in, uh, in contact with rocks and they, they are irradiated with, with X-rays um, and, and some other sort of radiation and they can work out the crystalline structure. There's two cameras for photographing in three dimensions. There's a microscope for fine detail. There's a Cora grinder to take samples. And there is that mole which is located along the back face there, that's the one that will trundle along the surface on, on a tether and then come back. And tacked onto the left there, a little bit of um, environmental monitoring, wind, pressure, temperature, etc. So all of that bit was managed by the University of Leicester, in fact, with uh, Dr. later Professor Mark Sims. And all of that had to be put inside a probe, as we called it, the probe. The lander was about 33 kilograms, and you can see it in the cross-hatched area. It's the, the, the solar panels are folded into the lid. The lid is closed down over the, the base, and then it's put in this aeroshell along with parachutes and airbags that we'll look at shortly. And this is how we were going to land. We would leave Mars Express, uh, I think it's, was it six, yeah, six days before expected impact, not a very nice word, but six days before we, we actually would hit Mars. We left Mars Express uh, at about uh, 30, 13,000 miles an hour. And as we just uh, dropped into the atmosphere, we could get up to 2000 degrees Celsius, but it would still be minus six internally inside that aeroshell because we'd been traveling um, through deep space. So the, the inside stayed cold. So that's why this is aeroshell to just protect everything until, well, and it will slow it down by just air resistance. But eventually, when it's down to about 1600 miles an hour, a pilot chute will come out of the back, which will pull off the uh, back cover. Uh, it will, will have slowed down to 600 miles per hour. And then another little explosive um, bolt will release a main parachute, which will pull out the lander itself, leaving the front shield to drop away. Then uh, we've slowed down to 36 miles an hour and about 20 meters altitude measured by a radar altimeter. Airbags will uh, inflate to enclose the whole lander. It would bounce about six times on the surface, it was thought. Uh, eventually they would be cut off so they would roll away. The parachute would blow away in the wind and there you've got our little lander sat on the Mars surface after just 7.7 .7 minutes of passing through the atmosphere. That was all the theory. Would it work? Well, part of my job was to try and make sure it did. Assembly, integration and test. Aha. Well, this is some of the assembly. The lander base there was, um, it was gold plated. It was uh, a carbon fiber structure. It was actually made by McLaren, who um, make uh, racing cars out of these light mate, lightweight but strong materials. They made that for us. You can see it's got three ribs there to um, give it some strength. But that meant that our battery on the right there, battery pack, had to be a somewhat funny shape. 
and the electronics boards equally were a funny shape to match one of those segments. The, the electronic boards sat on top of the, the battery. You can see all those bolts coming up where they, they sit on top. To give it a bit of scale, there's my mate Mick, the wireman. Uh, you can see the, the circuit boards there. And the jig that he's working on is approximately the size of the lender. Uh, this one came from the University of Leicester. That is Colin Pillinger's gas analysis package. You can just about see, I don't know whether my little thing works now. Um, it, it, it's, it's a set of seven ovens. You might see those with the, the little spikes sticking out of the top. It looks a bit like a, a miniature car engine. Um, they are the ovens that are individually fired up to evaporate certain rock samples. Uh, the gases will then be passed around the whole rest of it to, um, in, a, in a mass spectrometer to be analysed. And the clever thing is, if you look at the picture down the bottom, with Colin at his very large piece of equipment in 1969, he's managed to miniaturise that to go into Beagle. It may not be quite the same, but it's a pretty good approximation. Here's a couple more for scale. There's the uh, lander lid with that yellow uh, uh, antenna slot. Four solar panels uh, just before they are stowed away. And you can see the lander lid on the base with a clamp band around it. It's holding it shut until an explosive bolt releases it so that the lid will open. The solar panels are then released or they're deployed, opened up by motors, electric motors, individual on each, each solar panel so that they don't all sort of shoot off together and hit each other. It, it should be a controlled sequence. Well, to go to Mars, we had to play with international planetary protection rules. We were not to take um, any bio burden, any living life. Um, we, we had to sterilize our, all our equipment. And particularly since Colin was looking hopefully for signs of life, we didn't want to take any live life or dead life, if you know what I mean. No human hair, no flaky skin. So again, at the Open University, they built this planetary protection, um, super clean facility where everybody was dressed up totally almost. Um, looks a little bit pre-COVID, doesn't it? But um, the, the air was filtered to the finest level and people worked in there during the day and then people worked in there during the night, just absolutely cleaning everything down as best as they could. Um, so coming out of that, there it is. Well, we put the then the lander inside the air shell, and that was the completed job. And it was ready to go to. Well, there's the air shell itself, just looking on the inside. It went off to Toulouse in France, where it was. We lowered it onto the top of Mars Express spacecraft where that had been prepared by Matrimar, uh, the, the, uh, the French half of Matrimar Cody. And then we were off to Baikonur. Well, this great Antonov came into uh, Toulouse and it was loaded in. You can see two containers there. The spacecraft is the big one. Beagle was the little one. Nobody wanted really to take Beagle too. Um, because it had radioactive sources in it. It had explosive things in it. It had a battery. It had two radioactive sources. What else? Um, but we wanted equally to keep it really clean. So we built our own container and we had to get special permission to fly this somewhat hazardous device across several countries from France to, to Russia. Uh, yeah, it had to go to Moscow first, and then it, it flew on to Baikonur. Well, I didn't go in that. A couple of my guys did. There was no windows throughout the flight. But um, we, the rest of the team flew on British Airways club class to Moscow. 
And then we had to get on a Karat airline, which was a pretty dreadful Russian sort of aircraft from Moscow over to Kazakhstan. And that's where it is. That's where Baikonur is. It's the bottom end of Kazakhstan. And that is, well, Kazakhstan was part of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics way back when this space business and nuclear weapons were being developed. There's a lot of desert there. It's as close to the equator as the Soviets could get, but that's where we're going. It's, uh, it's the place where Gary Powers, do you remember him the, um, in his U-2 spy plane for, for America? He was going there when he was shot down. He, he actually um, was trying to find the place. It shouldn't have been too difficult because it's on the river, it's on the main railway line, and it's on the main road across Kazakhstan. It is exactly the place where you might expect to find a bit of um, a, 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 rush, a, a launch vehicle because you need all those supplies in there. But certainly it's all fanned out across the desert, as you can see. That's a view from the aeroplane coming in, lots of Soviet era blocks, it's desert, all that green stuff, trees, it only grows because they're watered. Um, we arrived in February when it was dry and very cold. We left in uh, June, when it was dry and very warm. Uh, just a couple of street views, there's aeroplanes and things everywhere. Lenin was still on top of the post office. Uh, there's one central heating plant that uh, through these pipes just serves the whole town. Yes, as I say, there's rockets everywhere. The one at the bottom is, is the Soyuz rocket, very much like the one that took uh, Sputnik and Yuri Gagarin up. And we're up to about nearly 2,000 of those. Nearly all have been successful. The range, we stayed in a nice hotel, but then we had to get on a bus for an hour and a half every morning, drive across the desert. This is buildings, isolated buildings. You'd think they're totally derelict, but no, there's a, a little bit of steam coming out somewhere or a van is driving in or out of something. They're obviously used for hazardous uh, materials or hazardous testing or fuel or something. But we didn't stop there. We got to the range head where there's a few more accommodation for, for workers, uh, staff. And then we came across this building. That looked a bit disturbing because the coach was slowing down by now. Now the story of that one, I don't know if you remember, but the Soviets had their space shuttle. It was the um, Energia rocket with the Buran space shuttle on it. It flew in November 1988, made two orbits of uh, the Earth unmanned. It landed unmanned. It, um, but it came at the time when the Soviet Union had just about broken up and there was no more money for space research. So it was put into that building that you just saw. Look at all those stacks of offices on the, on the left there. It was put onto another launch, uh, launch uh, rocket and it was left in there from 1988 until 2002, by which time the roof was leaking. So they got some people in, the people put all a lot of new roofing material up on the roof but it was too much and it all collapsed. Um, several people did actually uh, get killed in that accident and so did uh, that uh, Buran and its uh, launch vehicle totally destroyed and it is still like that today or it was in 2003 um, because this happened in 2002, there was a pretty emergency assessment of whether it was safe for us to go there. We were going to work in that bit that appears undamaged on the right of the picture. And it was OK. We never got to see in there. I uh, saw the photographs in the museum that they have there. And you can see those sort of low greenish coloured offices. That, that was the offices we were working in. So we went in there. We got on with it. 
we unloaded from our special container, which was inside that square box that went into the aeroplane. And we, it was put on to the spacecraft. And there's, there's the sort of final team that were there. There were a few more of us when we started, but some came home. It was the spacecraft then was, or the, the, the nose cone on the left was somewhat slowly moved over the spacecraft to encapsulate it. And the whole thing was mounted onto a railway truck to go out to the launch pad. You can see one yellow flashing light there, that's the health and safety provision. The man up on the ladder doesn't look too safe either. But um, we were more worried about the bats that were crawling about on the floor because they may well have rabies or something. We didn't know. So it went off to another building. Uh, I didn't get to see this because it was a bit uh, you know, hazardous, I suppose, and enough people needed. So everything was put on there horizontally. And then it, the train or the engine pulled it out of that building and across the desert for, I don't know, about five kilometers. And traditionally, you know, everybody walks alongside it. It's a, it's a kind of um, ceremonial procession, just as they always did right from 1957. And there I am in the middle of the picture there, behind me is a, a, a Russian soldier with a big flat cap. Um, photographing everything. Uh, the amazing thing is that we could carry cameras around willy-nilly and nobody cared anything about it as long as they knew we'd got one. So it's a top secret place that isn't secret at all really. The guy on the right uh, with, with holding a camera with the, the black jacket on, that's Andy Spry. He was the Open University's planetary protection officer and he is now very high up in planetary protection at NASA headquarters in Washington. He moved on there soon after Beagle. So everything was erected upright as they have done for 2000 launches. This by the way is the same rocket that launches men and women into space, but they have a separate launch pad. That's not from this launch pad. So the, all these access panels um, go up. And one of the last jobs for me and three Italian chaps um, was to go up the top and make final preparations. Pretty hazardous or, or dodgy thing was to make sure that our Beagle battery was connected to the rest of the electronics. Um, you, you keep it disconnected as long as possible so that uh, you're not wasting battery power, but um, we, uh, we had to connect it up finally. So final check though, that it was in there. As I say, we lost it, but it was there. We know it was launched. We waited a couple of days and left off. Just in, well, in Kazakh time, 23.45, 2nd of June, Colin Pillinger was over the moon because that was the 50th anniversary of our Queen's uh, coronation. It was a uh, quarter to six in the afternoon in uh, the UK. So that was the uh, 2nd of June, six months later, Beagle was ejected from the spacecraft and the spacecraft took a picture of Beagle disappearing. A little bit worrying perhaps that it's way off center. Was it going in the right place or was the camera misaligned? Um, you can see some other bits that might be stars, they might be um, debris, we don't know. And there were four or five pictures taken in sequence, so it, it kind of seemed to be going in a straight line and it, it wasn't tumbling or spinning. Just well, another quick look at that sequence, and that's what was going to happen six days later on the 25th of December, Christmas Day. So there you can see Colin, we went up to the Open University in Camden Town. Colin was there on the phone to NASA with a video link. Um, David Chuckman from the BBC was there. The lady, uh, the white hair, that's my good wife and I was behind the camera. 
and we waited for a signal from Beagle. We didn't get one. That was 2003. 12 years later in 2015, well, we never gave up the, 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 the hope that something would happen. Uh, Colin did get onto Jodrell Bank occasionally and asked them to listen, but nothing happened. January 17th, 2015, they announced Beagle 2 was found, exactly where the scientists left it. Now, I dispute that because it was exactly where the engineers left it, not the scientists. We, we actually did it. They, they were the brains, we were the brawn, so to speak. Um, the local uh, Steve and his newspaper, which is called The Comet, um, that was their headline. Um, didn't get quite so much. And I just love this one from The Guardian, where Mars Express, uh, December 2003 and January 2015, nothing's changed except along the bottom, Beagle 2 missing, Beagle 2 found. Although you will see in the middle, EU referendum pledged. Well, we did actually have that, didn't we, after 2015? But then, oh, what was the name of it? Um, that, that one of the NASA Mars, uh, Mars orbiters um, with super resolution cameras suddenly had returned this photograph of where we thought Beagle might have landed. Uh, I just wish I had it without the annotations on there, because if, if you can see little white spots, well, two little white spots in the top squares, and there's a bit of a black smudge in the bottom square. Well, that's what was interpreted, that uh, top, top square there is, is the lander. Well, could it be? Then the parachute in the middle and the rear cover at the bottom. Let's have a look at some more pictures that they were slowly coming through in January. 2015. These were, by the way, five kilometers away from where that the ideal landing, uh, the center of the landing ellipse. Well, this is a good sort of this 10, 10 meters uh, there. Look, there's the, the, you can see a bit of structure to the white blob, and you can actually see, I can see another little white blob just above it. Go in a bit better, you can see, uh, still see that structure there an absolute limit, which is, that's, uh, that's, uh, this is about 25 pixels square from that original image, which had over a billion pictures. So somebody has really gone in there very tightly. And you could overlay a sketch of what the lander would look like at, the, at that resolution, at that size, uh, proportionately, you can see there would be a base lid and two solar panels, and that kind of lines up with the with the white bits, the, the sunlit bits. We had four solar panels, and the antenna, unfortunately, was underneath all four of those solar panels. We needed all four to deploy before that antenna would work. Well. <laughs> We think, well, there's a few more pictures. Yeah, the, the, the first look, best fit, shows two solar panels. The first, they are the first two in the sequence. Somebody says up, up the top there, they might be just possibly a third panel sort of showing somewhere. I don't know about that. But we did need all four to deploy. A, to get that antenna out, and B, to get enough power um, charging into the battery from the solar panels. Um, it would have been really useful, actually, if we had a picture before and after this. We didn't get the picture before. I, I've sort of made it up with a bit of photoshopping. Um, but, you know, if we've got those two images, it, it would have been great. But, you know, did, it, did we identify Beagle? There was some criteria that were set by the scientists before they made a decision. It had to be in the right place. Yes, it was five kilometers away. It had to be relatively flat. Uh, it shouldn't cast shadows because it is quite flat and thin. Bright and reflective, yes, it's not dull earth. It's, um, it's made of gold plating and things. It shouldn't be red and orange. It should be more like gold and silvery colors and bits of black. 
and of course the right size and shape. There were other things. Could, if you had a parachute, it would be blowing in the wind or moving between images. You'd expect things in some likely dispersion scenario. And maybe it should look a bit man-made rather than like a chunk of rock. Well, and yes, appear in more than one image. Yes, it did. Different parts of the camera detector, so we weren't looking at blank pixels. And we could combine, or the scientists could combine a few images to enhance the resolution. Just one or two more would have been better. But some super resolution processing was actually done, and they came up with things that really did look like sort of on the, on the left there, a bit of crumpled parachute. And the bottom right, you know, maybe a, it, it kind of got a shape of a rear cover with a pilot parachute attached to it. And the lander and front shield, I'm not quite sure where the front shield is there, but um, it, it's, um, it, it, look, it looks really, really does. And I, I think I can say now, we were absolutely convinced that, you know, our lander had landed. That, no, no, it did not crash onto Mars, it landed. You know, and as I say, even somebody suggested the four solar panels there, I, I don't know. Um, but for that, we did get the team silver medal from the Royal Aeronautical Society as the, the sort of mission engineering. So we were pleased with that. They recognized that, yes, our lander had done pretty blooming well. Mars Express carries on, keeps surprising us today. Um, on the right is one of the very first Mariner pictures. On the left is, is, a, is a Mars Express picture. Absolute fantastic detail. The end of 2018, they reckon they saw us a layer of liquid water about a meter or two under the South Pole surface. And the next mission, 2016, is their life on Mars. This is one of the um, not so great newspapers. We were going to embark on an alien hunting mission. The Times, I think it was, we're heading back to Mars for the first time with the aid, a European Space Agency to find life. I'm not sure what we did because I, I'd retired by then. But uh, it was a trace gas observer to be launched in March 16 with an entry, descent and lander model uh, demonstrator called Schiaparelli, which was going to do much the same sort of thing when it landed on the 19th of October 2016, except it didn't have airbags, it had little gas jets and thrusters that would soften its touchdown. Well, everything went to plan. Uh, Schiaparelli separated from the spacecraft on the 16th of October. It arrived and it landed on the 19th of October. But here is a, a GIF image. Um, before and after, you can see that's before, that's after. You can see a black spot appears and down the bottom right, you can see a white spot appears. Something has landed on Mars. They, met, they had their before and after pictures, you see. Um, a couple of days, they got some really good image uh, processing. The front heat shield there looks as if it's made a nice splat. Um, the parachutes and back cover seem to have, you know, some, some structure to them and motion. But the lander, well, that looks as if it's exploded, doesn't it? And since it had rocket fuel in there for those thrusters, it's not surprising. The thrusters had, in fact, cut out as soon as they'd switched on, so they never did their job. So unfortunately, the European Space Agency didn't demonstrate that they could do it any better than Beagle. In fact, they were probably a bit worse at it than Beagle in this particular case. Well, you've probably all been aware of um, 2020 China, United Arab Emirates and NASA all launched uh, Mars probes. It was another launch window when the alignments were great. Um, China had a lander and a, a camera that went off on its own somehow that landed in May and hopefully is doing some results. United Arab Emirates, they got there in February and Perseverance rover in this little helicopter that's made a lot of news 
landed February and uh, the helicopter has been buzzing around quite a lot. Well, Europe should have put its ExoMars rover up at the same time, but it wasn't ready. Um, there were a couple of issues um, with some of the structure of that. So that was delayed till next year, 2022. Um, India and Japan are going to have a go in 2024. India's already got Mars Orbital 1 up there. It's going to put another one. And Japan's doing something a bit different in 24, hopefully going to one of the moons. ESA and NASA are talking about sample return missions. Very complicated thing to do that. Putting a, getting a sample, taking it up, sending something else to collect it and bringing it back. But why not? This is anyway ExoMars uh, Europe 2022 now. And that's being built at Stevenage where we built Beagle. It's called Rosalind Franklin, prominent scientist between discovery of DNA basically. Um, the Italians wanted to build that, but Stevenage won out and, and got the job. Um, I, I do wish it all the best of luck. It, it's, it's kind of, it's been ready to go. It, it's the, the rest of the carrier spacecraft that's, that's been holding things up. And well, back to Colin, he's got an asteroid, uh, asteroid named after him now, 15614. Um, that was in 2004 that was named. And when the Mars Opportunity rover um, moved around to the Endeavour crater and took that view at the bottom, they named that Pillinger Point in, in honor of Colin Pillinger. So yeah, local man at this part of the world. But this is in memory of Colin. You'll notice that uh, he died on the 7th of May, 2014. So he actually never knew that Beagle had actually soft landed on Mars. Uh, he never saw those photographs. So that's a great shame really. So I, I, I just keep doing this talk in, you know, in memory of him. And uh, because it's, I, I find it's interesting, I, I hope you have too guys. So um, how am I doing for time? Um, You're doing all right, Terry. That's it. Right. Well, I'll stop sharing then, shall I? Okay. That's that's great. Uh, thank you for um, a really great review of uh, Beagle 2. Right, ladies and gentlemen. If, uh, as always, if you want to ask a question, please put up a digital hand. If you can't find the way for all to do that, wave at me frantically and I shall try and uh, see you. So, starting off with Catherine. Catherine, can you unmute yourself, please? Well, I heard that the Americans were very funny about foreigners looking at their banking balloon technology. Did you have trouble getting it to go to Moscow and uh, Kazakhstan? Um, um, could you just say that again, please? I heard the Americans were very funny about foreigners looking at their bouncing balloon technology that they used to uh, buff it, uh, uh, stop the Beagle 2 bank uh, uh, crashing. Uh, they had, had these big balls of uh, bouncing balloons. Oh, yes. 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 Uh, did you have, have any trouble get, allowing them to uh, take it to... Uh, Moscow and then Kazakhstan? Um, no, um, yeah, I do remember that now. Yes, they were they were made in America, tested in America, the, the airbags. Um, but because we put it all into that Beagle probe and closed it all up in the UK and never to be seen again until we got to Mars, then that was okay. Yes. But, um, They've, they've actually gone away from that now and using these retro rockets. And, and in fact, Sky Crane, haven't they? Things have moved on a little bit now. But yeah. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Uh, thank, thank you. And I'm uh, still looking for questions. Wave at me if you've got a question. And... 
Tony, Tony Morris. Hi, Terry. Uh, some, some years after uh, Beagle had made its uh, landing on Mars, there was a, a, a conference in Sheffield given by a, a senior ESA scientist who was quite dismissive of the efforts of, of the Beagle 2 team uh, and said basically that ESA should never have taken the craft. Uh, did you get any of those vibes? Oh, uh, I, I, know, I know what you mean, actually. Yes, there was, you know, when, when, they, when they agreed to take Beagle onto their spacecraft, they were very cautious that, you know, we could be, um, what's the word, a single point failure. If, if something had gone wrong, if it hadn't ejected properly, it could have been an encumbrance to some of the future mission. Equally, um, you know, that we were, what's it, 38 kilograms we were allowed. If, if all of a sudden we weren't ready, if we weren't ready to fly, we were not going to be, they were not going to delay the mission to wait for us. They would put a dummy mass on there because they will have calculated their um, moments of inertia and centers of gravity, and they would have to fly a dummy mass that would, they, they would have to reject at some point as well. So the, the pressure was certainly on us to, to, to get there on time, uh, not to give them any excuse to say, well, clear off then. No, we, we had to struggle through. Part of that struggle was to get the funding. All sorts of people were offering to fund us uh, uh, up front, like um, BT, for instance. Um, but the, in the end, they didn't because they, they kind of saw this was risky. And I think this is ESA's main concern that, yeah, the bad news is that it failed. You know, you've, there was, we had a discussion in 2015-16 um, how can we get put the record straight, basically, because ESA will have closed their, their reports, archived all the paperwork. It's in their archive to say we failed. It, um, there was, it's in Hansard in the British Parliament, where somebody reported on an inquiry that said Beagle 2 was a bit of waste of UK taxpayers' money. But it was, <laughs> we, we firmly say that we developed something we worked hard, you know, if only people like your very good selves listen to us and say, well done, you know, it can be done. And, and Colin did have a damn good go at it as well. Yeah, you're, 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 you're kind of right. They, they weren't totally happy, no. My you understanding, know. Terry, is that some of the technologies that were developed, especially on the masthead, uh, that fan camera arrangement. Yes, yeah. That went on to fly in various forms on other missions. Yeah. Is, is that true? Um, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know about that, anything in particular. What I do know about is a um, <laughs> totally different subject, but the, the, that gas analysis package um, is being used in, you know, with different different sort of, I don't know, wavelengths, materials, all sorts of things. That they are carrying something very similar like that around Africa, medical people, and it, it, it can be used to detect TB, tuberculosis. Mm. And another version is being used in, in, in Scotland to verify the purity of Scotch whiskey. Believe it or not, you know, it's because it's, it's miniature, important. it will fit in a shoulder bag, whereas it used to fill up an entire lab. Um, that's a spin off, if you like. ESA probably wouldn't be interested in that at all, but uh, it's an incredibly important task that, yes, checking the purity of Scotch whiskey. Yes, um, yes. so uh, I've just had a, a quick note from uh, my uh, chairman, Les Marsden, who wants to remind everybody. Who can remember that Colin actually came up and talked to us about uh, a Beagle 2 uh, ah. and we were very lucky to uh, have him address us. Um, 
So I'm still looking for questions. I think. Uh, so as an insider, Terry, where do you see uh, the UK's place in space exploration and the exploitation of space? Do we think, do you think we're in a good position? Now? Well, you, you may have seen it was in, was it today's paper? Boris Johnson has been to the Stevenage factory and he was totally impressed by how well Britain is doing in the telecommunication satellite business. Um, the, 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 um, that, that's always been, we've, we've always had a pretty good role. Most, uh, an awful lot of telecommunication satellites have had British structures to them and, and the propulsion systems. The electronics has generally always been French or German or something. I'm, ta I'm talking in Euro European terms. Um, we were actually leaders in the new European global positioning system. But that was run by the European uh, Union, not by the space agency. So when we pulled out of Europe, we lost all that expertise totally. We, we can't use their new system anymore. So that's a problem. Um, there are scientific programs that are going on. It, it depends on the space agency and how often they um, fund programs. There was Aeolus that is looking back on the earth for like wind, wind directions, wind speed in very fine detail. Um, I, I think there's a lot of environmental uh, spacecraft coming along line because it is very topical and very, very necessary as well, I think. Uh, pure science, I don't know. I, um, I'm not sure that there's, there's an awful lot going to go on. Um, I, I think what we are, we're all a bit um, confused by very rich people putting up 20,000 little tiny satellites and they're all getting in your way, aren't they? Um, you know, I, and I just, I don't like that at all. And equally, I have no truck whatsoever with anybody who wants to think about ever taking a man to Mars. I just, it, I don't think it's worth it. It's, it's just not. And you'll pollute the place as soon as you get there. So, <laughs> But I, I don't know. I think we might be um, for science. I love I love the science side of it. I do, but so I'm always in that sort of kind of thing. But, well, I'm I'm retired now. <laughs> You're out of the fight. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Got a nice pension. <laughs> okay, ladies and gents. Oh, uh, Catherine wants to have another chat. Yes. So, uh I'm of the opinion that the Americans seem to be embarrassed by the Viking uh, mission results about life on Mars and they don't seem to be looking for it. Uh, I was at an SBA uh, online talk about six months ago and I asked them about why the Americans don't appear to be really looking for life at the moment. And uh, the answer was that uh, there's this like international treaty with and if they think there is life somewhere, then they can't can't land on it. Is that right? Oh, it's it's this kind of. It, I'm sure it's a planetary protection. I, I'm sure. <sighs> I, I don't know. I, I I'm sure you, you as we did, and and it's my my old mate there, Andy Spry, who's head of planetary protection in NASA. I'm I, I had a talk. I saw him on a Zoom talk about six months ago. And he, he certainly explained how it is possible as long as you sterilize and keep your spacecraft clean and know what you've got on it. And you might have to zone things off so that if you do land in a crater, that crater is no longer biologically secure. Um, but I don't think there's any actual treaty that says you, you can't go there, no, no. All I would say is I, I would you need to do things slowly and steadily and don't go doing anything brash. That's my thank view. You. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Uh, uh,
Can I just make a couple of points? Um, there are two UK-led initiatives at the moment that ESA has approved. Uh, one is the Twink sa Twinkle satellite, which will be launched in 2024. The other one is basically the aerial satellite to be launched in 2029. These are both connected with exoplanet uh, research and are really very advanced studies. So they are, in fact, uh, some indication that ESA is, in fact, following what the UK is uh, proposing and supporting that in terms of future launch opportunities and really quite advanced science as far as exoplanets are concerned. So it's not completely lost. No, okay, right. Okay, thank you, David. And I think we've worked Terry hard enough this evening. Uh, if there are no more questions, then I'm going to ask you to give him a big next for Swinton Astronomical Society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Terry. Okay, well, enjoyed that. <laughs>